Let me just give you kind of an introduction of what we're into. We're talking about love. And uh, the reason we're talking about it is because uh, the Lord told us, he said, if you want the power and the presence of God to manifest or the glory to manifest, he said, just love people. And the supernatural will come in behind that. So the question is, what is love? What, what does that look like? And like I said before, I was raised in the church, heard that we're supposed to love people. I mean, yeah, we're supposed to be, we're supposed to uh, love people. We're supposed to spend time with people. We're supposed to get together with people. And in my mind, that interpreted into, well, that's what love is. And in reality, that's not the scriptural definition for agape love. So we decided to take a real deep look at this, and that's what that booklet is about. If you don't have one, feel free to keep that one and just bring it for the next two, three weeks because we're going to be working through facets of it. Uh, last Sunday, we talked about how love and truth are, are married. They're together. And I left you with a question. Can we say what is true but not be truthful? And, of course, you know, the, the, when I was asked that, uh, the Holy Spirit asked me that a few years back. He said, can you say what's true and not be truthful? I had to really think about that for a bit. Uh, and I obviously came to the conclusion, yeah, we can say what's true and not be truthful. Let me give you an example. So someone comes up to you after service and says, hey, you want to go to Culver's? Let's go out and grab a bite to eat and, and uh, let's go to Culver's together. You happen to not necessarily like this person, know this person, want to hang out with this person. This is not the first person you want to go out to eat with. So you say something like, well, I don't know, we were thinking of uh, probably just going home and not going any place, but hey, we'll, we'll do that at some point. We'll take a rain check on that, which that might not be totally right there either. But, you know, okay. And then you get in the car and you tell your husband or your wife, you know, so-and-so, they asked us to go out to Culver's. And it's like, they're weird. Why would we want to go out to Culver's with them? <laughs> and don't look all pious and innocent because you've done it. <laughs> they're just a strange bunch. I, I, I wasn't really interested in going with them. So... Maybe your plans were to go home after service. That could be true. But you didn't tell them the truth of why you're not going out with them. Did you? We do that all the time. We do that kind of thing all the time. We'll tell them something that's true... But what we really think and feel is over here. But we're not going to tell them that. But we'll tell them this to get out of it or, or make the decision or whatever. From God's perspective, flash, flash, that's lying. You sh and, and here's the... Here's... <laughs> so when he told me that so I'm in conversation with the Holy Spirit now so I said so you actually want me to tell them I think you're a little <laughs> you're a little tweaked I don't know if I want to go out and eat with you you want me to tell them that and this is what he said he said, if you know anything about love, the problem is not with them, it's with you. Whoa, that's like getting slapped across the face. But God, I'm uncomfortable with that kind of person. I mean, they're loud, they talk a lot. Whatever, whatever it is, you know, whatever it is. I, I'm comfortable with them. See, I'm, I'm reasoning with God now, trying to defend my poor attitude. And this is what he said. He said, do you think maybe sometimes I think you're a little tweaked? <laughs> <laughs> ah! 
but I'll still hang out with you. <laughs> well, then now I got the point. It's like, yeah, the problem's not that they're tweaked and I'm all righteous in my decision. The problem is I don't know how to love. I should be able to hang out with anybody and make them feel comfortable. The example of that even scared the, the disciples, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees because Jesus hung out with the worst bunch. And they loved him. But we don't understand, we don't recognize love. Now, I'll, I'll give you one deeper than that, and I've had this happen. Not often, but I, I can count them on one hand, but it's been more than once, to where someone in the church is trying to extend themselves, get to know some people, get some friends. They ask somebody to go out to eat with them. They give them a half-truth answer. Well, no, we were planning to do that. Da, 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 da. Maybe we'll catch it a different time, this, that, and the other. So the person who asked them said, well, we're going to go out to eat anyway. And they go out to eat. And here comes the person who turned them down with somebody else. Exactly. And then they've come to me and said, do you think maybe Matt doesn't like me? This is what happened. I asked him, and he's... And then we go out to eat, and here he comes. And he's eating with somebody else. And he just said he was going to go home, and now he's eating with them. And I invited him, and why did he go with them and not me? And Gotcha. Gotcha. Now you're caught with your hand in the cookie jar. But the worst part about that is this. Those people are now damaged. Yeah. By our hypocrisy, they're now damaged. We didn't help them. And they may not come back to the church, which hopefully could have helped them more. Because of, we don't know how to love. So aren't you glad we're going to talk about this? Amen. <laughs> yeah. Take your booklet. Go to page two. It's the first page with printing on it out beside the cover. I'm going to just read down a little bit this and give you a, a, give you a kind of a basis of where we're going. And then we'll go into, excuse me, we'll go into some of the definitions and we'll get as far as we get and we'll pick it up next Sunday. God's love can be a very difficult thing to define. Let me stop there and say, if you're watching online, this should be on today's, if you go to messages, this should be there in PDF form to where you can download it or open it on your device or whatever and follow us along. So it is online for you who are watching online. All right, back to it. God's love can be a very difficult thing to define. The reason most scholars struggle with it is because there are no words or concepts in the human vernacular to do it justice. The application of it also becomes difficult because it is often confused with our human concepts of what we think love is and what we think love is like. So this is my attempt, me, to bring some light to what is called agape love, the God kind of love. As you will soon discover, there are many different kinds of love and none of them are bad in themselves. However, when we try to use some of the other types of love to describe God and what God is looking for in us, that's when we get in trouble. From my studies, the main area of confusion that I find is that most people define love on the basis of a feeling or emotion. And on the next page, it gives you that little survey that I did that we talked about a couple weeks ago. Uh, love being a feeling or emotion, that is a human concept and it is not what is laid out concerning God's love. Here are three of the most important things to keep in mind when we are trying to understand God's love. So here's kind of a summary of what I see before we actually go look at it. Number one, God's love is something or God's loving something or someone begins with an attitude, a mindset, or a state of being. That's agapeo. We'll see that here in a second. The logical process of thought is the basis for that kind of love. 
Agape or agapeo is not emotionally feeling based. And it is the farthest thing from being an emotion. It is much, much more in depth than that. So it starts with, it's like forgiveness. How many of you ever felt like forgiving somebody? I'd sooner string them up sometimes. It's like, I don't want to forgive you. You need to pay. But God says, I have to forgive them. So how do you do that? It's a choice of your will. That's where it starts. I choose to do what's right, even though my emotions are saying, are you crazy? What's wrong with you? No, I'm going to forgive them. And you begin working the process. Love is the same thing. I choose to love you. And we'll define what that means. But it's a choice. I choose to do this, whether I feel like it or not. So number two, with God's love, agape or agape, intense emotion and passion can be involved. And in its perfect state, when it's with God, in that perfect state of love, I believe is always present, the emotion is always present to support the decision to love someone or something. But the emotion, the feeling, the passion do not lead in God's kind of love. In other words, we don't base whether we love someone on how we feel about them. They follow and support what we choose, the attitude, the mindset of loving. In agape love, we love whether we feel like it or not. You know, when God said, I regret I even made man. Wish I wouldn't have done it. King James says he repented of making man. God is love. So do you realize that when God was saying that to them, he still loved them? You know what he was saying? This is how I feel. I'll kill the whole works, Moses, and I'll start a new nation out of you. I regret I ever made him. But in that emotion, now, if, if God's love would be based on feelings, we probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> it's not. He is love, so he loved them, even though his feelings say, yeah, this is ugly. I want out of this. Number three, as believers, we're commanded to love. Emotions cannot be commanded to feel a certain way. I command you to be happy. You're depressed? Well, let's get over that. I command you to be joyful. Right now, start. You can't command emotion. But yet love is a command. Thou shalt. You know what that means? It can't be an emotion he's commanding. He's got to be commanding a logical choice. Mm -hmm. Emotions cannot be commanded to feel a certain way. So we know the commanding of love has to do with our will and choosing to love regardless of what we may feel like. So to understand agape love, the first thing we need to do is separate ourselves from any thinking we have about love being feelings or emotions or love is reliant on feelings and emotions. I don't feel like I like them. Too bad. God says, love them anyway. In fact, he said, I'm commanding you to do it. Well, but I don't have the feeling, so how can I do it? It's not a feeling. It starts with a choice. God's kind of love operates with or without feelings that support it. In most cases, that's where our love for someone will begin. It's a decision. Then as time goes on, the feelings and emotions may develop that support that. So go over to page number five. We're going to skip three and four. We'll come back to those later. Go to page number five. I already went through the book last Sunday, kind of told you how it lays out in case some of you studied it through. That's all good. Uh, middle of page five, under the 
Agapio, G25 in parentheses there. I'll just remind you of this. Agapio, which is actually, we always think of the word agape as being God's kind of love. Agapio is actually used more in the New Testament than agape. And it is the mindset or the decision. It's the attitude of a person saying, I will love. Agape, on page 6, about the middle of the page where it says G26, next line down, agape is referring to actually doing your mindset. Agape is putting into action the attitude of, okay, I'm going to choose to love them, so now I am going to do that. That's agape. So going back over to page number 5, agapeo, that's the word that's used the most, <clears throat> It's the mindset. It's used about 117 times. Uh, has a number of definitions, and I give you three sources on all of them. I give you uh, Strong's Concordance, Young's Concordance, and Thayer's Greek English Lexicon. Uh, Young's is, gives you the worst definition. He's good with some things, but definitions isn't one of them. Strong's is better. Thayer's is usually the best. But starting from the top down there, G25, that is the number assigned in Strong's Concordance to that word. And this is what it means. And I just give you the exact definition, the way it's in the concordance, and the way they write things sometimes makes you go, huh. Perhaps from, again, much, or compare 56, 89, semicolon, which means you stop there. That told me nothing. To love in a social or moral sense. Well, it told me something, but not much. Because it's like, well, what does that mean? To be loved or beloved. Well, there you go. That's rich, okay? So I'm just telling you what I found. Young's Concordance says to love. <laughs> well, there again, told me really nothing. But Thayer's, he, he does a much better job of taking these kind of words apart. So this is what Thayer says. To love is to be full of goodwill and exhibit the same. So if I'm going to choose to love you, I am going to be full of goodwill towards you. I want your life to be awesome. And all these definitions make sense when you apply them to God, because he looks at us and says, I want your life to be awesome, blessed. He says, now do that with each other. So if we make up our mind to love someone, according to theirs, the first thing we have to decide is, I want their life to be super, super great. And what happens with them, I just, I'm going to have goodwill toward them. Okay, so now let me give you an example of how that should work, but doesn't always work. And this happened numerous times during my growing up period of time, as well as I was an adult and I had it happen to me two, three times. Um, so I'll just give you the example. If my dad got a new car, how are you going to think about that for him? Well, agapeo, the mindset of love, says, good for you. Awesome. I hope you got the best car you could buy. Good for you. And we grew up in a rural community, so everybody knew each other, and we had a little church. And, you know, so when someone pulled up with a new car, everybody knew it. I mean, it's like, ooh, look at so-and-so got a new car. Okay? For the people who had goodwill towards you, hey, look at there, you got new wheels. Can I see them? You know, and they'd come and they'd goo and gosh over it. and Wow, that's nice. I like that. And it's good for you. I'm glad you got that. And then there were people who never, I'll give you what stuck in my mind. I was a little guy. We pulled up. Someone just got out of their car. Dad was getting out. Same time. They get out of their car. They walked around the front of the car to go into church where we all love each other. And they walk past, I'm watching this, because I'm a little kid, I'm proud, we got a new car. And my dad's bigger than yours anyway, so. 
you know, that mindset. And they walk past the front of the car, and they look at it with this kind of scowl, and they looked at him like, and turned to walk into the church. And they never said one good thing to him, wishing him well with his new car, ever. But if they got one, they expected everybody to goo and gosh over it. And if you didn't, what's wrong with you? I don't know if they didn't see themselves or didn't understand or whatever. But the scripture says rejoice with them who rejoice. You get a new tractor, you get a new combine. See, I grew up on the farm. You get a new tractor, you get a new combine. Get a new $6,000 bull, whatever. Rejoice with them. Well, good for you. Hopefully someday we can get a combine like that too. We're still with the old one, but we've been looking and it costs a lot of money, but maybe we'll get one too, but good for you. Rather than, I don't see why you need a new combine. We don't have one. See, that's jealousy. That's selfishness. That is not agape love. Agape love's first definition is, I will choose to wish you well even when my emotions say, I wish you'd go to. <laughs> I won't fill it in. You got to fill that in. <laughs> we can be emotionally totally distraught, but we choose to bless them in their situation. You say, isn't that being fake? No, that's called a step of faith. Yes. We're not going to follow our emotions. Next definition there, to have preference for, wish well to, regard the welfare of. And in parentheses, he describes it a little bit. At least I got that wish. Nope, that's just in mind. So let me give you the application to that. To, pre to have preference for them, to wish them well, to want them to fare well. That's what welfare means, fare well. To truly prefer someone, we need to put ourselves in their place. It's called empathy. It's an emotional thing. So emotions does work with love. It's an emotional thing, which many European people struggle with, the emotional thing. We don't express it like other cultures do. We've been shut down in that area, most of us. But when you, to really prefer them and wish them well, you try to put yourself in their place and say, I would like it if that happened to me. So good for you. I wish you well in this. Your emotions might be going, that ain't fair. I've gone to church longer than them. Why did God do something for them and not me? That's your fallen nature speaking. Shut it down. Because if you start following it, you will come out of wishing them well. You will not prefer them. And it can be something as easy as you see a mother has a child in one hand and, and a bag of groceries in the other, and she's trying to get in a door, and you actually open it for her because you would like if someone would have done that for you. Rather than the attitude of, well, nobody ever did it for me. Why should I do it for them? Oh, you're just a wonderful, loving person, aren't you? It can be that simple. Wanting the best for them. Wanting, wanting them to just move forward in everything God has for them. It's the love of Christians toward one another. That doesn't really tell you a lot. The benevolence which God, in providing salvation for men, has exhibited by sending his son to them and giving up, giving him up to death. So, again, it's, it's, he's trying to draw a picture here of... Okay, the, God chose to send his son to die on the cross for us. It says in the Old Testament that Jesus, as the word of God, realized that was speaking of him, and he volunteered to do it. Now, God is in perfect love. Maybe, I wasn't there, don't know for sure, maybe God said, I am so excited. 
you get to go to earth and I get to kill you and ring, ring Isaiah 52, Isaiah 53, I get to ring your soul out and totally rip the life out of you and I'm going to turn my back on you. You're going to think I betrayed you. This is going to be the most awesome, exciting thing. And you're going to go to hell. And you're not going to know if you're getting out other than you're going to believe the word which says you will not abandon my soul to hell. You're going there going, this could be it. Woo! Aren't you excited, Jesus? Maybe that's how it was. All kinds of good emotion around this. And then maybe it was God said, we have a choice to make. Neither one of us really feels like doing this. But we're going to make a choice, and we're going to save them. We're going to give them a way out. Now, I'm human, so I don't think and feel a lot like God. But my guess is the second, not the first. I don't think God was all excited and jubilant and threw a party because he gets to go do this to his son. I don't think so. It was a choice. So that's what he's trying to describe there. It's the love which led Christ in procuring human salvation to undergo sufferings and death. Well, what does Scripture say? For the joy set before him, he endured the shame, despised the shame of the cross. He did this because he loved us. Was he joyful in the middle of it? No, he despised what he was doing. But he knew joy was coming. If I do this, it's going to turn out good. The love with which God regards Christ. Here's a good one. This comes out of John, obviously. When used of the love of a master, either God or Christ, the word agapio involves the idea of affectionate reverence, prompt obedience, and grateful recognition of the benefits received. Okay, so let's just take the prompt obedience one. God lays his finger on you and says, stop that. How many of us go, oh, I am so excited. I've been waiting for God to tell me to stop this. I am just filled with glee and anticipation of how great my life will be. Woohoo! I can't do this anymore. Anybody like that? But we will be quick or prompt to obey because we love Him, because we feel like obeying. Most of the things that God says you need to stop this, we're doing because we like it. We're not doing it because I got to do it again. I got to go. I mean, I just have to go be selfish. I mean, I know I shouldn't do it. I don't want to do it. But something inside me just, I, I, it's just my lot to bear in life. I just have to go and make a selfish decision and hurt people around me. That's not our attitude. Our attitude is we don't even know we're being selfish. And God lays his finger on us and says, you know what you just did? That's wrong. You need to stop that. And we're going, ah, oh, man. That's how I go. There's days he says something to me. You need to stop doing this and start doing this. And I'm going, I didn't think it was that bad. And it's like, seriously? Yeah. Seriously. Okay, I will obey you because I feel like it? No, because I love him. What does that mean? I will prefer what he's wanting, and I will take my mindset and say, I will obey you in my attitude. I will begin working on this. When everything inside me goes, I hate this. See, true love doesn't start with emotion. True love starts with a choice. And obedience comes out of that choice. This next one is good. To take pleasure in the thing 
prize it above other things, be willing to abandon it or do without it. Wow. That carries some emotion with it, but you're making some choices in that. I'm going to prize this. I'm unwilling to abandon this or do without this. Take that and apply it to, to the example I gave before of, of some new person is approaching you. They want to get to know people in the church. Well, in reality, that's already backwards. Those of us who are here longer should be approaching them. Okay? But some new person approaches you because you're not approaching them. You're standing with your little click and talking and not paying attention to the fact there's new people here at all. Because you love those people and you get along with those people. And they're your favorite people. And there's a new family standing over here all alone feeling really awkward while you're standing over here having a good time because it's all about you. And the Holy Spirit taps you on the shoulder and says, you've got to stop that. When new people come, you've got to learn to love them. Oh, no, I don't love them. I mean, I love everybody. No, you need to go actually engage with them and invest your life into them a little bit. Oh, man, shit. You can just hear it, you know, going, no, no. I don't want to do that. Yeah, but I'm asking you to do that. So the choice on that now is going to determine if you're going to obey or disobey. Unless you're really a, a person who loves to get to know all kinds of new people, for those of you, this won't be your problem in loving. This will be like, oh, yeah, I can do that. That's great. Ooh, good for you. You got your issues too, so don't get too excited. <laughs> but for others who don't want to necessarily drag more people into their life and abandon their best friends, this is going to be a choice. And they're not going to feel like making the right one. But when visitors come, we choose, because we love them, we choose to prize them above. We're unwilling to abandon them or do without them. Ooh. Oh, I love them. I just didn't think anything would be required of me. <laughs> yeah. To love means to steadfastly cleave to. We're commanded, husbands, we are commanded to love our wives. Whether we want to or not. Part of that is steadfastly cleave to. In fact, that was one of the first things God said. Leave your parents, men, and cleave to your wife. Hang on to her. Even during those days, you think you got a porcupine and you're getting stuck. <laughs> so all kinds of bristles out. And it hurts. Well, I don't feel like hanging on to her in those days. And this is, just, this is emotional, too. It's not just physically holding on to her. This is, I'm committed to you. We're getting through this, and I will not leave you. Well, those days I don't feel like it. That's because love is not based on feelings. Love is based on a decision. I will do this, honey. <laughs> Enough said. So there's a couple of more. <laughs> you want a marriage class now? <laughs> Come on, keep it coming. <laughs> so there's a couple other definitions there. And then underneath it, you've got on page, top of page six, you've got uh, all, the, all the scriptures where agape shows up in. But the, by definition, it's a, it, if you could sum it up, agape is a mindset that says, I want nothing but the best for you. And I will view you and look at you like, just be blessed. Just, just have the best life possible. Agape is the action that follows that mindset or that thinking. We'll talk about that next week. I want to hit one thing here yet before we're done. And to do that, I'm going to need to...
to screen share because it's not in your book. So I'm just going to show you my notes. And I've got it here. This, this will be interesting to you. So as soon as this connects, there we go. I'll go back to my notes. 1 John chapter 4. Let me go this way. It might make it a little bigger. Yeah, that helped a little bit. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 and 21. Let's apply agapeo a little bit to Scripture. If anyone says, I love, that's the word agapeo. I love God, yet hates. We're going to come back to that word hate. Yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who does not agapeo love his brother, whom he has seen, he cannot agapeo or love God, whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command. Here love's commanded. Whoever loves God, if you agapeo God, you must also love or agapeo your brother. Holy Spirit asked me this question. If love is something that is so desired, or you could use the word easy there maybe, why did I have to command people to do it? Right there is the command, verse 21. The reason, in my opinion, is because we really don't understand what love is supposed to look like. We have our definitions, and most of our definitions are self-serving. We do the exact opposite of Scripture, and we're going to show you that over the next few weeks. We love those and invest our life in those who are willing to reciprocate on that and invest back into us. And that becomes our circle of friendships and love. That's phileo love. It's in the Scripture. And it's not the one we're supposed to have. We're supposed to have agape love or agapeo. We don't understand it. And when we do come to an understanding of it, Sometimes we're not so excited about doing it. Often our definition of love is not what he's talking about. What we think agape love is, is very difficult to do. What we think is easy is phileo, and we'll describe that. So now I want to go back to, here's the scripture. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. Well, I don't hate anybody. It's just some people I get along better with than others. Okay? Well, let's look at that word hate. This is interesting because it talks to our culture. G3404, that's the number in Strong, so this is probably the Strong's definition. I didn't write it down, but I presume this is Strong's concordance definition. It means to hate or pursue with hatred or detest. We can say, well, yeah, right there. It says, See, I, I don't do that. Well, let's go on. Not a few interpreters have attributed the signification to love less or to postpone in love or esteem to the word hate. To slight somebody. Now, this is really interesting. Through oversight of the circumstance that the Orientals, now he's talking about Orientals, he's talking about Chinese people, he's talking about Asian people, and he's given an example now. The Orientals, in accordance with their greater excitability, are want, or, or they want to both feel and to profess love and hate. So if you go to China, or you talk with Asian people, what they're saying is, when they feel love or hate, they really express it because they're really excitable people because of their greater excitability. Where we, right there, where we Occidentals, who is an Occidental? I'll tell you in a second. Where we Occidentals, with our cooler temperament, you were not quite as, quite as excitable, excitable. We feel and express nothing more than interest in or disregard and indifference to a thing. So we're not so hot to love and so cold to just, I hate this. We just kind of get a little bit more indifferent or show a little more interest. Notice who the Occidentals are. Look it up. Occidentals are people of European descent. 
See, we've got a cooler temperament. Well, I don't really hate anybody. I just don't have much interest in them. I just, you know, I'm kind of just indifferent. I'm in the middle. That is the definition for the word hate, 3404. If anyone says, I love God, but yet they're just kind of indifferent. I don't really hate them. I'm just indifferent to them. I don't, I don't know. They, they grind with me a little bit. Their brother, and you choose to live like that? God says, you're a liar. You can't love me and treat your brother, your fellow Christians, that way. Oh, ye great Occidentals. <laughs> I'm one too. So when we say, well, I don't really hate anybody. I'm just not really interested in them. I mean, why should I go out to lunch with someone who I'm not really interested in? I mean, it's not like I hated the lady that didn't get into the Mission 61 house. I really love her. I don't never got to know her, but I really love her. But it's not like I want to get involved financially to help anybody else. I mean, it's, it's just, I don't know, some might want to, but I just kind of look at it kind of like a neutral thing, kind of just indifferent to it. You know what God says? Don't tell me you love me and treat people like that. You're lying to yourself. Whoa. Whoa. So let me give you one example and we're done. Um, you can black that out or I can kill the screen sharing here too, I suppose. Um, this has happened numerous times. One time in particular, the person challenged me. They had come here with their family for a few years and we were in this building already. And, they, and like I said, this isn't just this one situation. This has happened numerous times. They said to me, they said, Pastor, I don't understand what the deal is, but the people here don't really have any use for us. It's not like they treat us bad. They just, whether we're here or not, really makes no difference to them. I said, ah, that can't be. They said, seriously, we can sit out in the foyer on a Sunday morning, and nobody will talk to us. They'll walk through, and they'll talk to different people, and they'll have their little groups, this, that, and the other, and we're sitting there with our family. Nobody will say a thing to us. I said, I don't believe it. I'm going to watch. Two, three weeks. You come in the next two, three weeks? Well, yeah, we'll be here. I said, okay, I'm going to hang around the foyer. I'm going to watch this. And they came in and sat down. Nobody greeted them. They took their coats off, and they sat there, and they were working with their kids. And nobody, they were there for 15, 20 minutes before they came in to hear. Nobody said a word. Well, I don't hate them. I'm just really not interested in them. God says that's hate because it's not agape. You're going to invest yourself in them whether you feel like it. Oh, I don't feel like it. That's not the point. The point is we're commanded to love. Amen. So I think it was the second or the third Sunday. I'm kind of just trying to be off by myself watching this. And, you know, I'm always talking to people, so I'm kind of ignoring them while I'm, I want to watch this. Are we actually that unloving here? And this guy comes walking in the back door, and there was somebody by the windows in the, on the north side where the literature rack is. There was a family there. This guy comes walking in the back door, walks all the way across the foyer. Good morning. I am so glad to see you. Gives him a big hug. How are you little guys doing? Da, 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 da. I'm glad you came. Turns around the direction toward the benches where they were sitting. And did this. And walked away. And the lady looked at me and said, Well, the guy didn't really hate him. He was just indifferent. 
He wasn't interested in their life. He wasn't interested in talking to them. Maybe he didn't really like them. But if you'd ask the person, are you a loving person? Oh, yeah. I mean, didn't you see how I greeted them? Yeah, and I also saw how you ignored them. That's not love. Well, do we have to talk to everybody? Just that question shows you've got a problem. Do we have to? I don't know. What did Jesus say? He commanded us to love everybody. So I'm going to send you home with this thought, because this is one of those things you don't have an altar call for. You say, go home, think about that. <laughs> Why am I required to pay attention to everybody and talk to everybody and be nice to everybody and try to greet everybody? And you don't have to. You know, you know the answer. That, well, you're the pastor. It does not say the pastor is supposed to love the people and the rest don't have to. If I would treat people like that, some of you who never go out of your way to get to know anybody here would call me on it. Pastor, why don't you ever go talk to them? Why don't you? Well, I'm not the pastor. Well, do you love or don't you? Well, I don't think that has anything to do with it. That has everything to do with it. Pastor is what I do. It's not who I am. Who I am is a child of God who is required to keep his commands just like you. <laughs> Shouting material right there. See, so when it comes to loving people, I've, I've had this, it's hard. I'm not saying it's easy. It's hard, but this has been a rule of thumb of my whole ministry. I cannot treat anybody different than anybody else because God refuses to do that. And he is love. And if I've got my favorites and they're the ones I give the attention to and some of these people over here, if I even look at them, they feel like I threw them a crumb. That's wrong. Everybody has to be treated evenly in agape love. Whether we want to or don't, whether we feel like it or not. You say, that's hard. That's why he commanded us to do it, because we don't feel like it. Because we're in a fallen condition. <laughs> Did you learn anything? Wish you stayed home this morning, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I could have missed that one. Well, I'm going to talk about the same thing next Sunday, so you better not come then either. <laughs> yes, do I need to be nice to everybody? Do you love everybody? You mean I actually have to talk to some people I've never talked to in this church in my life? It's not like I hate them. I'm just kind of indifferent towards them. No, God says you hate them. And you need to switch that to love, which means you need to want the best for them. If you were them, empathy would say, I'm standing here alone. Nobody's talking to me. I would want someone to show me some attention. So empathy would say you need to love them and go engage. So we can be a loving church.